very special guest, John Saunders. Um, for those of you that might see YouTube out there, you got John. He's got a really popular YouTube channel. John's going to show us some tips and tricks to uh, basically leverage the HSM platform in the cloud. So for those of you that don't know yet, um, the HSM platform is available in three flavors, Inventor HSM, HSM Works and Fusion, and the workflow is exactly the same across all three platforms. So what you learned today from John will be able to be carried over to uh, whatever software you might be using or interested in using. Before we get started, just a couple quick questions to understand where the crowd's at today. I want to understand what kind of machines everybody's running. John, this generally is a uh, pretty straightforward answer for our group. Any guesses as to what the most popular machine might be in our audience today? I would I would guess. Uh, yeah, I've actually participated in a few of these before, and I think Haas uh, usually took the lead. I'll be curious to see what folks say today. So today, yeah, we're, we're Haas is definitely a, a strong force, but we got quite a few others. So guys. Uh, these are live and interactive, so as as we're going through stuff, feel free to shout out your company in the chat. Tell us what machines you're using. Um, you know, share a little bit about your your company. Give us your social media handles. We love uh, interacting with everybody in that environment. And just quick understanding as to what CAM software everybody's using right now. Um, let us know what you're using. We always like to understand. Um, you know the environment of the crowd that we're presenting to. Okay, great. People are voting pretty aggressively. This is awesome. And look at that. 65% are using the HSM platform in this audience. That's amazing. So guys, thanks for joining us week over week. This is where we provide tips and tricks for everybody. Uh, John, I've got some more questions, but I'm going to hold off on those. I want to, I, it's my understanding that you've got a brief presentation and then we're going to jump right into the technology. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, let's do it. Let's get you the presenter role. Awesome. Can you guys see my uh, screen with the part up? Absolutely. Yep. Looks great, John. Awesome. So. I'll keep it short. Uh, my approach to all of this is a little bit different, uh, just mar largely based on my background. So I grew up in Ohio, went to college uh, in Boston at Babson College, which is known for its entrepreneurship program, studied entrepreneurship and finance, moved to New York City, uh, had a desk job and day job totally unrelated to anything. Uh, machining and engineering and manufacturing, but uh, you'll see in a second how I came into all that. And sort of fast forwarding, I now uh, I'm proud to say we live back in Ohio with my wife and family and so forth. And these slides are a little bit uh, a little bit out of order, but I did want to throw in here this three little mantras that I've always enjoyed as an entrepreneur, which is the one of which is fail fast and fail cheap. And HSM and the Autodesk platform is a huge part of that for me because it's this idea that I can go from an idea to holding a part in my hand now, sometimes in hours, which I just love. Um, being honest, for me, that's always been a big part of my story, not just in the cliched sense, but literally be honest with yourself about what you enjoy, what you're passionate about, what you're not good at. Uh, I think it's it's a lot of fun to hang out with people that are don't have those insecurities or, or are open with them and, and are you know know what they're good at, know what they're not good at. And there's a lot of things I'm not good at, but I've, there's a lot of things I've gotten good at uh, over the years. And at heart, I'm a bootstrapper. I'm a sort of scrappy guy that likes to stretch my dollar and do a lot. And and again, going back to how we use the Autodesk software, I think really helps fit that mentality. So how did I get into all this? Uh, I grew up as a competitive shooter. I wanted a better rifle target and I hired engineers and machine shops and we came up with this version one prototype you're looking at this sort of inside guts and a lot of you on this uh, on this call probably know oh you see some machined aluminum and steel that's been cut and, f and formed or but I, when this was made I had no idea I didn't know what a CNC machine was I didn't know what a press break was laser you know end mill I knew nothing and that bothered me so sort of long story short uh, I bought a really small pinch top CNC mill that you can see 
on the right hand of the screen here, and this is in my New York City apartment. This is literally 72nd Street, and if it's kind of a fun picture to pull up because this has been a while back, but you know, there's a little mini lay, there's a little bandsaw, there's some diacro notchers and finger brakes and so forth, and uh, you know, I, I learned, I totally fell in love with it, and proud to say that I now run uh, about a 10,000 square foot shop here in Ohio. Uh, Tormox have been a big part of our story. If you're not familiar, these are uh, very value-oriented, prosumer type machines. You know, a, a fully decked out uh, milling machine with the tool changer is going to be something like $20,000. And, and they've really uh, built, helped us build a business into something uh, that I'm really proud of. And we actually did just buy our first Haas VM3, which will come here in a few weeks, which is a huge, just I'm beyond excited to, uh, to run that. Um, so we do four things. We run a small job shop. Uh, we've got the YouTube channel, NYC CNC. So every Wednesday, we put out a video called the Wednesday Widget. Uh, every Friday, we put out a video on Fusion, uh, called Fusion Friday, which includes the HSM sort of CAM platform, which I legitimately love. Uh, we, we, we actually offer CNC training classes now here. We've got a, a variety of different types of classes. Some are more software focused. Some are actually hands-on running the machines. And we make some of our own products. And I left this, uh, this is a recycled slide, but I left this diagram in the middle because both the Autodesk platform uh, has been a huge part of our story as well as Tormach. We were, when we started, we used a variety of CAD and CAM, uh, moved to SolidWorks and found HSM Express. Uh, loved HSM Express, uh, graduated to HSM Works, and I legitimately, I would have stayed there, but for us, Fusion made sense because of the YouTube audience. You know, my goal is to sort of use my YouTube channel to change the world and that reach uh, based on the sort of, you know, not everybody can cut that check for Inventor or SolidWorks. Uh, so that's one of the things I love about Fusion because it has the same awesome cam side to it. Um, so today, uh, you know, I, I've enjoyed these uh, HSM webinars. Thank you to the HSM team to putting these on and, you know, seeing guys like Rob Lockwood show some pretty cool fifth axis stuff is something I love. Um, we're going to kind of go the other direction, which is, um, to me, a little dose of how I live in the real world. This is a part that a customer sent in a couple weeks ago, and I, with their permission, said, hey, this is a great uh, example. We're probably going to make a YouTube video out of it. But they emailed us, and they said, hey, we're new to, uh, you know, we're new to HSM, we're new to Fusion. How do I machine this part? I, I, I figured out Face, I figured out 3D Adaptive, but you know, this isn't code I want to run. And one of the things that's interesting is this part is, you know, it's simple, but it's not. There's some nuances here that, uh, that you guys can probably appreciate if you're seasoned machinists like these, uh, both inside and, and sort of top fillets. One of the things that I also noticed is the diameter, I think, was 248. So, uh, in practice and in theory, I should not use a quarter-inch ball end mill to, to do those. Um, for us, I would probably call the customer and say, hey, do we need those? You know, are they important? Um, one of the things I remember taking away from uh, Tim Paul's uh, uh, probing routine was talking about how look, parts get over-engineered because in that example, it was people are trying to sort of carry tolerances through or stack tolerances up when all we really care about is a certain thing. So one of the things I like here is I could go in to model and I could even click something like this and delete it. But let's say it's, you know, it's not necessary or we want to change the size of it or it could become a chamfer which is easier to machine. Um, so I would probably have that conversation with the customer. But hey, if they want to machine it as is, we'll bid the job, no problem. So I practiced this probably two weeks ago and then I thought, you know what, um, Instead of coming into this webinar with a completely polished, you know, here's exactly how you can do it with no hiccups, uh, let's just walk through it. Uh, and you're going to probably see me fumble and struggle, but uh, again, that's kind of the world I live in of let's figure it out. So I'm going to go to a new setup. And I've got some kind of wonky settings here in my software, and I've just got the screen recording hiding that. There we go. So first thing I'll notice, um, and again, we're in, I'm in Fusion 360, this is all, for all intents and purposes, identical within both, certainly I know the HSM product in SOLIDWORKS and I believe the Inventor HSM as well. 
So I'm going to change stock to be a relative size box. And here's the thing. I used to hate relative size box because I thought all you're doing is adding a little bit of stock around my workpiece. That didn't make any sense to me, especially because if I were to change my part, that changes my stock. And if I've already cut my stock, boy, that's a really bad uh, outcome. But what I realized, or what I learned that this actually is, is you would say round up to. So this is a larger part. Um, so let's say round up to half an inch. And the idea here is it gives us these three dimensions, width, depth, and height. And this is going to more likely tie into either your material storage rack, you know, back in the shop, what do you have on hand? Or if you're going to go order something, this is going to tell me, uh, subject to having a little bit of cushion around the side and the top, I need to order this size material. Or if, you know, let's say we were ordering it, we'd cut it a little closer, we might be able to drop down the height. But you can kind of see, boy, not too much difference there. Setup, obviously the orientation is wrong. So I will switch to select Z-axis. And the one thing I've learned here, I used to try to kind of jump ahead. You really have got to follow the order. So the Z-axis is wrong, but even if the Z-axis were correct, go ahead and fill in that field and confirm it. So Z-axis will be this. I'm picking a plane that is perpendicular to, like so. The other thing that I could do, to start over there, because I can click a line that's sort of collinear with the Z. So I'll click that guy, same result. X-axis, uh, I can honestly at this point just click the tip here to reverse it. And I've now got my work coordinate system triad set correctly. I want to move uh, the point. Actually, you know what? I'm going to leave it there because it's centered in my part. And that's how I would set this up. Um, I wouldn't find the left edge because if my sock happens to be a little bit different than what I've modeled, I still want it to be equidistant uh, on the left and the right. That way, when I go to take that first pass around, I'm not going to, say, take a very light cut on the left side, but double up over here on the right. So good to go. Click OK. We'll call this webinar. First thing I always do, face. For me, we've got, uh, raise your hand if you've got a messy tool library. Um, one of the things I've preached is uh, to set up your tool library and then export it and kind of save it as a permanent uh, archive. And then every month or two or three, just wipe out your tool library and re-import your master. Uh, it'll do a better job of keeping it clean. And I say that, and uh, I'll be honest, I don't do that enough. One of the great things about face is you don't have to do that much. One of the things I've always gotten in the habit of doing is on the fourth tab, passes. See this uh, stock offset? There are great pops-ups in HSM. Here it says, specifies the distance the machining boundary extends beyond the stock in both X and Y. So I always add about a quarter inch. Here's why it doesn't really cost me anything in time and it's a good measure. Uh, there's a particular reason I do it uh, as well, which is we're using a, an, a face mill from Tormach called the Superfly, which doesn't really have a precise diameter based on the way the insert bar is set. It's kind of like a fly cutter. So um, this gives me a little bit of a good cushion. Let's just do a quick simulation, and I'll show you. You know, on the first pass, we're cutting with about half the cutter. On the second pass, you can see this, all this, uh, most of this over here has already been cut. So we're really only cutting right here. So by adding that stock offset, I, the only extra time I took was the increased diameter of that linking move, which is n nothing. I mean, literally a quarter of a second. And I'm going to run a little bit more off the back side of the part now. Okay. So next thing I'll do is probably a 3D adaptive. 3D adaptive clearing, and I would use a shear hog. Uh, for me, that's a single insert, uh, excuse me, three-quarter inch end mill from AB Tools that we love. It's got a really high positive uh, rake. It's great for aluminum, only for aluminum, and it's great for uh, our Tormach machines that have a little bit lower horsepower. 
So I am usually a big fan of clicking OK, which I can't yet because I have got some height plane defaults that are screwed up. So bottom height, I'll come back and explain this. We'll do stock, or we'll do model bottom. Now click OK. Don't worry about that. I like clicking OK right away for two reasons. One is too often, if you don't get in the habit of clicking OK, you'll go in and boy, you're just in you're in you're in God mode. You're just like I got this, and you're going to go tweak some settings. You're going to go change your containment. You're going to adjust your passes, and then you realize, you know what? Actually, I don't know if I like that. And you hit the escape key, and if you hit that escape key, I'll show you right now. So 3D, you know, let's say we pick our tool, and we go in, we pick you know a containment zone, and we adjust our point this. But then we say, you know what? I didn't want to do that. If <laughs> you hit escape you lose everything you just did. So again, create our operation, click OK, create that operation. Now it's permanently there. You're not going to have the same risk of losing the work you just did. And I'm a big fan of get code. Uh, it's much easier to refine your CAM toolpaths when you have code. Uh, or tool pass rather than when you do something that generates no uh, tool pass, you don't necessarily know what you did. What was the setting that caused you to get no tool pass? Because we've all been there. It's super frustrating. And you're kind of, it's one of those WTF moments where you're just like, what do I do? And sometimes it's easier to start over. So let's take a look here. What would I do? My go-to recipe on this tool is point two, point two. Find step down, I don't really want to do too much. Um, find step down would basically adjust the stair steps or water line. Uh, it'd be more relevant if we had a 3D surface that we were trying to adaptively rough. Uh, but here, I don't, uh, I'm not too worried about it. You definitely want flat area detection checked on most parts. If you don't have that checked, here's what happens. You've got maximum step down and you've got minimum step down, or excuse me, flat, uh, fine and minimum. Uh, and you know, this is a good example where uh, I just, I'll be being honest, I don't necessarily always know or pay attention to all the intricacies of this, uh, what, what is what. Um, but what will happen is if you have a flat on your part and it doesn't fall on one of those even increments, it's just, it's not going to machine down like it normally would subject to your axial, axial stock to leave. Uh, and I should mention, uh, please, I don't have a way, I guess, right now of seeing the questions that are coming in, but um, if you guys do have questions, by all means, this is, uh, I'd like, like this to be as interactive as makes sense. So, hey, John, check. just to let you know, um, we have application engineers sitting by. So everybody that's on the call right now, submit your questions as John's going through this stuff. And just keep in mind, what he's showing us today is the same exact workflows on all three of our products. So if you're using SolidWorks, then you're absolutely fine. You're going to leverage the tips and tricks John's showing you. Same thing with Inventor. So get your questions in there, let us know, and we've got application engineers standing by to answer those. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. You know, when we brought our first employee on board, I had tried to get him to learn uh, Sprout Cam, which was this really esoteric Russian cam software. It's powerful, but Boy, he just, it was tough, and we switched him over to HSM Express, and uh, you, you hear these stories, but it's not until you witness it firsthand. You know, Jared was making parts the next day. We had a, our summer intern start the next day. After, after his first day, he was running CAM, making parts. I love the functionality of the HSM CAM. It's just awesome. Um, so uh, that's enough. Don't, don't be a hero. Click OK and take a look at what happens. Uh, the adaptive toolpaths do take a little bit longer to compute. Uh, so something to be conscious of. What the reason they take longer is amazing. Um, so one of the things I'm noticing here is, look, this doesn't pass the smell test. Uh, I'm not getting any tool pass on the outside or the inside of my part. I'll go back. Actually, I'll just simulate from here with stock, and you can see hmm, that's not uh, that's not right. That's okay. Right click, edit. Geometry. So we've got to tell it. Uh, in this case, I think just checking stock contours will uh, will do the trick. Let's see. Awesome. So see how it changed. It's now 
uh, calculated and adaptive tool path subject to what it views as your stock right here. That is huge. Um, why aren't we getting tool paths on the outside? Um, so one of the things that I've learned is 3D tool paths are awesome. Most of the mojo in running good 3D tool paths uh, comes from understanding toolpath containment. And boy, there are a lot of ways to do it. We'll get into, into some today. Um, I haven't come close to learning all the tricks though there. So under geometry, see this uh, tool containment? Right now, it says tool center on boundary. And again, uh, I'm going to give another shout out to Rob Lockwood. He did a YouTube video on toolpath containment that is just superb giving some SOLIDWORKS uh, diagrams or showing these in a little bit more detail. But basically, in this instance... Uh, can, if you want me to jump in for a minute, I think I see what's wrong. It's, it's actually rest machining you wanted to check on, not stock contours. So you can uncheck stock contours, and then rest machining I'll take into account for stock. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so we're not getting the outside cut because, again, Right now, it's only allowing the tool to go on center to the outside of the stock. So let's add outside boundary and click OK. And the reason if this, I hope this isn't sounding, appearing tedious to you guys, but again, this is, this is to me, understanding um, how to problem solve on your own to me is the key thing in, in kind of stepping through this stuff because you don't always have um, the time or the ability to go leverage somebody else's help. So that's the thing I love is is being able to just have that mentality to break down the problem and just walk through settings. Um, so now the first thing I'm noticing is I've got these red helical ramp-ins. Uh, that's a great way to get an end mill into solid stock, but I've got these holes. So you know I would honestly probably poke a drill through this first. So let's show how we would do that. I would say drill, and I don't have a point to drill here, so let's go back. We'll do a quick sketch, sketch point. On this plane, and it doesn't much matter, I'll just put it here in the center, stop sketch. And so back in CAM, I can do drilling. I don't think I've got a three-quarter drill modeled up, so we'll do one real quick here. So we'll make it a one-inch drill. Not going to worry about the feeds and speeds on the webinar here. And I will click selected points, and that's going to let me pick that point as my drill location, and I would do a probably a partial retract chip break on this. Height, hole bottom, I would say stock bottom, drill tip through. Uh, and again, I kind of violated my own rule there where I started making a bunch of setting changes without saving that operation, but drilling isn't so bad. So I like this because I've now got a hole sticking right through my part, and that can get drug up above the adaptive. Where this really shines is when you can use a drill that you're already using. So obviously we're going to have to drill holes in here at some point. Being able to then poke a hole, you know, drills do a much better job at removing chips uh, generally than end mills do, or it's faster than a helical plunge. What I can now do in my adaptive is go over to the linking tab, pre-drill positions, click that same point, and it's kind of a funny quirk. Uh, the ramp type still says helix, but you're going to see those red uh, helical spirals go away because it recognizes we've got a hole there, and it can plunge right down through it. And again, with the flat area detection, what you're seeing is it's going to see this plane right here and subject to the axial stock to leave, it's going to go ahead and clean up this plane right here and hog out most of our material. Do a quick simulation. I'm a big fan, again, of going to sim and not watching the sim, but rather just hit clicking this go to end of toolpath. 
and you can get a look at where that's going to leave your part. It's a little bit slower, I think, because of the screen sharing here. Oh, no, there we go. Okay, so that's bothering me. It's not doing anything on the outside of the part. Uh, and again, I think it's because it's in, it's, uh, someone correct me here from the Autodesk team, but I think it's because it's a coincidence that our stock isn't big enough to allow that tool path to, uh, to get outside. So if we increase the additional offset, uh, and the way I do this is I'll usually do something pretty ridiculous, like one inch. Somebody want to chime in? Yeah, it looks like you've got the machining boundary set to selection. You should be able to set that to none. Perfect. And then I won't have to do that? Yeah, because you got a blank selection in there. So if you set that to no machining boundary, it'll... Hmm. Why is it? Uh, do, have... You can also do bounding box. That's the, the whole outside of the part. Uh, you wanna... Yeah, the selection, you had a blank selection in there. So it's kind of... Okay, let's, I've got an idea here. We'll go back to that, and we're going to add a kind of a ridiculous amount, and that's okay, because I can always come back and refine that number back down. What I want to see is, let's say I let the tool go a full inch outside of my um, work area. Is that going to fix this problem? And it did. So that, to me, is another good example. Now, here, because it's, a, it's an intelligent strategy, and if you guys aren't aware, uh, the fundamental difference between your list of 2D and 3D operations, it's actually not really two-dimension versus three-dimension because in 2D, you've got things like trace, which can function in three dimensions, as well as in 3D, you've got things like horizontal that are really two axis uh, or two plus one movements. The difference is that in 2D, I'm generally inputting, manually importing things like contours and holes to tell it where to go. Whereas in 3D, I'm really leveraging the solid model. So uh, the fact that I've added this kind of ridiculous amount of offset shouldn't matter because it's still analyzing what to machine uh, in the part. Um, cool. So I like that. I don't want that to recalculate uh, on the rest of this webinar because it's kind of a longer process. So I'm going to right click and go to protect. Now be careful because if you're in an iterative process where you're still making CAD changes to your part, uh, and that is the great thing about the HSM products all being integrated CAD, uh, this can bite you and it can bite you big time, but it is really nice to lock your toolpath down and that way you don't need to worry about uh, changing something in the setup or in your CAD model forcing you to regen it. Uh, so let's get down to the tricky thing, which is how are we going to machine these funky fillets. So I my go-to guess would be uh, pencil. So 3D pencil. And for me, you know, we don't have a huge tooling inventory here at our shop. Um, I know I've got 3 16 ball end mills. I doubt I have anything between that and a quarter inch. So 3 16 it is. Click 3 16 uh, Just click OK. Um, See what you get. Uh, so pencil's a pretty awesome toolpath. It'll go through and it'll clean up nooks and crannies, if you will. But that's not what I wanted it to do. I wanted it to work up here. We'll just focus on this uh, area right here. So lots of ways we can do this. And again, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm legitimately working uh, live here. My first attempt would be to do a selection tool center on boundary is fine for now and just move your mouse around to fix to pick the area you want that's the selection I want for containment and the other thing I'm going to do now under passes with pencil uh, and actually I think Al taught me this this I'm going to reduce the step over now to like 10 20 thousandths and I'll just have it say 10 step over so the idea there is a 20 thousand step over times 10 would be 200 thousand that should be more than enough to cover this area. I may still want a smaller step over when I actually go to generate the uh, cam that we're going to machine, but for now I'm in problem solving mode. 
I don't care about the perfect step over. I care about my toolpath containment. This is going to be faster to click this and see what we get. Now, that wasn't what I wanted. So, interesting. If I let the uh, tool center go tool outside, and that's probably one of my first go-to things to experiment with. Let's see what happens. Okay, no. So, so I think I think you're I think you're demonstrating a, a very good point. The best way to learn the software is to make one change, and the toolpath will calculate very quickly. So I like how you're showing this, John. Yeah, I think, and, I think in this case you need to add the over thickness because that radius is larger than the radius of your cutter. Is that what it is? I, I, I believe got, so. I did get this working though. Okay, okay additional gosh. thickness, which is applied to the tool to detect passes. Radius. Okay, so, and so what, what kind of value would I want to put there, Al? So the, what the over thickness value does is if you have a one eighth inch cutter, but you want to find a quarter inch radius, um, then you would add a sixteenth of an inch. So it's it's basically saying uh, by this pretend the cutter is bigger to find radiuses that this can fit into. Um, so you could I mean you could go way big on that. Uh, you cool. Just that it's it's bigger. So let's look at this. I did cheat yesterday and practice a little bit for this, and I did get this toolpath, which is what I liked. This is my concluding. When I thought, saw this, I thought, okay, because here, when I look at this pencil, I'd say, wait a minute here, you know, um, that's nor this area here is not normally how I would run uh, a toolpath for a really good, smooth-looking uh, part. This is better. Um, so two ways. We can just walk into this in edit mode here, and... I've got tool center with an additional offset, and then I use to avoid touch surfaces. So let's see if we can replicate that quickly. The other, and I, interesting, I don't have over thickness. Um, what I do like to do as well here, I'll go to simulate, turn stock off, and I'll click on a uh, portion of the toolpath. And you can see this isn't a perfect toolpath by any means, um, but you can now see here get a better angle of that. Try to click an area that's perpendicular to the, the bottom view. And you can kind of see yeah, that should work if I play that slowly. There you go. Uh, what you can that's see is that just going to make a comment. It's quite exciting to see the questions coming in. There's a lot of machinists on here demonstrating there's many different ways to attack a part, and that's what makes our industry fun. It's To me, it's exciting watching watching the comments come in of, oh, I might approach it this way, and I might approach it that way. So I think you're definitely a thought-provoking webinar. Good job. So the other thing, this is like, God bless this uh, Autodesk for this. This is the the best feature that I don't think gets talked about enough, which is compare and edit. So I'm going to click the pencil that I have down here. Um, and by the way, let's say that that pencil is just a rock solid setup. I'm going to right click, store as template, and I'm going to say awesome pencil. Because then when I want to start another part, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I don't have to go find that other part. What I did three months ago for that customer in a different folder, I can right-click on my active setup, create from template, awesome pencil. Templates are huge. Um, but what I want to show you today was, let's say you don't have a template or you're just trying to figure out, why the hell does this look like this and this looks like this? So click them both, right-click, compare, and edit. The list that comes up here is phenomenal uh, to the point that I, it's my understanding that some machinists that are at level 70 and above are um, using, creating their cam operations, not populating them, and then coming in to compare and edit and actually just populating them this way. But what you have here is every single input parameter, um, searchable by the way down here, so in other words I can type in height and get up all my heights. You've got the description of the parameter. Go ahead. You know what you might show here too, John, right? The next where you search where it says all, you can show just the things that are different between the two. Oh, I didn't even know about that, Al. Thank you. So perfect. Pull up what's different. So look at this. Um, great, great example here where I didn't do a good job naming. Um, well, it's a little bit weird here, but let's call this one pencil web, and I'll call this pencil good. 
now I'm going to get a better descriptors at the top. So what's different about these two? Uh, the pencil good, I'm using avoid touch services. I'm doing an additional offset. Uh, I have a by tangency angle, which I have no idea what that is. Um, height selection, so okay, and then here's the other big one. So rather than having to remember those in my head and think, okay, let's go back into pencil web and fix them, just fix them right here. Um, avoid touch services won't make sense to finish here because I can't actually um, edit the surfaces, but so I'll make a mental note to, to do that. Um, and let's say tool center on boundary with a 0.05 offset. Click OK. So avoid touch surfaces. Uh, we just turned that on in the compare and edit. And so what I'm going to do is click these faces that I want to machine. And be careful. See what I just did there? I added eight faces and a body. Um, that was not what I wanted to do. I just wanted that little guy there. And by default, it will then avoid those surfaces. We obviously want to do the opposite, which is touch. Click OK. Look at that. Now, uh, I don't like the fact that I'm not getting something over here, but now that's starting to look like a much cleaner toolpath. You know, that makes you happy. Um, let's see if I can figure this out, though. Why am I not? Uh, oh, the other thing I mentioned about compare and edit, you'll notice on things like avoid touch surfaces, I'm not able to right-click on that and set it at that as my default. Uh, which is, if you're not aware, a great thing in Fusion is much of the, uh, many of the CAM inputs are parameter driven. So I don't know if they're going to edit expression. So the tool diameter times 0.1. So you can edit that formula and you could right click and there's two different default options. Make default, as I understand it, would make it the default within this file or this part. Make all default would apply it to every you know, John Saunders pencil that I ever do again. Uh, unfortunately, you can't do that with avoid touch services, except you can if you come into compare and edit, avoid touch services, yes, right click, make all default. So that's a little uh, secret. Yeah, so, so I think uh, maybe I'll explain why, because it's, it's a good thing. First of all, compare and edit's in all three products, so the guys watching this that are uh, doing their design work in SOLIDWORKS or doing their design work in, in Venture and using that for a CAM, you can get at this in all three of the HSM products. Um, and so then the clarification is anything that's a drop-down or a checkbox, th there's not a way to right-click over it in the user interface. So those sorts of defaults you can change and compare and edit, whereas the input boxes you can right click over so there's the flexibility to change the defaults in the UI. But the things like check surfaces was a, a drop down or a check box, so you need to go to compare and edit to change those defaults. I'm glad you brought that up, John. Um, okay, so why is this not working though? Um, again, I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, you, you, you know, no matter how much time you spend in the software, and I spend a lot of time in the software, I don't think you'll ever become a master at every single operation. So leveraging the hover-up windows, uh, or whatever they call these things, pop-ups, um, is, is pretty awesome. And I think that was one of the differences that I had. Um, oh, uh, um, getting sidetracked. One of the other things I would mention as well is sort of more of a machining or tooling uh, point of view, but being able to control either up down milling or outside in you know any the center of any ball end mill or any pointed tool has really poor to disastrous surface feet per minute so being able to cut further out towards the uh, outside edge of that tool is better so if I were to cut this part or any curved part like this from the outside up which is a little bit counterintuitive because generally we tend to machine uh, top down but coming in from the side and working your way up is going to minimize the amount of cutting that's actually done with that part of the tool where you've got very little uh, room in the gullet for chip evacuation and, and poor surface footage. Um, so let's see here. I'm on the spot. Can I figure this out on? Uh, let's see. I would probably add. You might want to the, double check what tool you use. Are you sure you're using the same tool? I think so. Um, so there we go. The rule of thumb is additional offset 
if you're not sure, make sure your additional offset is more than the radius of your tool. So you saw I, I had 0.05 using a 3 16 end mill. So obviously my additional offset was less than the diameter of that tool. So it was not letting it come around here. Uh, I believe that's why at least. And when I say, so let's see, let's, let's jump it up to, uh, so one uh, 3 16 is, let's say, yeah, 0.1 is a little bit more. That lets it come around. Now I got a heights problem. That's easy to solve. And uh, again, the heights are another phenomenal way to control your toolpath containment. And I don't know that people always realize or appreciate that, that heights can have that role. Um, in, in, in this case, the top height and the bottom height. Bottom height, selection, pick that plane or face, click OK. Awesome. Guess what? I actually like that better than this. Um, if we take a look, I suspect we're going to see there's some unnecessary cutting. Uh, actually, I think it's cutting top down, which is what I said I don't want to do. Okay, so let's see if, uh, see if I can fix that. Is it as simple as going outside in? How about up milling? You're going to get more linking moves, but no, that didn't do it. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so what's interesting is it's doing some sort of whispery type cuts up here. I wonder if there's a way. So if you don't mind interjecting again, I'm sorry I'm keep interjecting here, John, but I think it's no, I think please. it's good. So so John's what I love about what John does though, he's working through his process and he's on a webinar here with well over a hundred people watching. Uh, and he hasn't got himself flustered, he's just continuing to to adjust and refine his toolpath. And I think it's maybe we're not every day all uh, on a webinar, but I know I've been that guy that's Friday night and you want to get home and you got to get stuff done. It's very easy to uh, throw yourself off the game when things aren't working. So even though it's a webinar about the software, I think we can all learn a lot, John, from how you just stay calm when things are not going exactly how you'd expect it and work through the problem. It's, it's very common. I want to get home for my kid's baseball game and that's <laughs> when stuff starts to get really bad. And you handle yourself very well. It's, we can all learn from that. Well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, raise the white flag. Oh, wait, did I just fix it? If I did, I don't know what I did. <laughs> Darn it! Anybody watching? I don't know. I don't even remember what I did right there while Al was uh, was trying to distract from my lack of flustered flustering. Um, I honestly wasn't that, trying to distract. I thought it was quite exemplary the way you're handling yourself. So look, this is awesome, um, and this is a great example of where. Um, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I got to do more than just cam. I can't. I love being good at this, but I'm. I, I don't have the luxury of spending every minute of every hour and every day mastering this. So this is much better than the toolpath I came up with previously. So I would definitely save that uh, as a template to reference it. And the nice thing about templates is you can um, export them as well. So you can, uh, you know, keep them as a, their own sort of version of a backup or repository. Um, that could be a pretty valuable asset. Um, I want to hop over to another file real quick and then leave some time for questions. Uh, another great example, customer who's, who's new to the HSM platform, honestly did a pretty damn good job on their, I think this was one of their first parts uh, of machining this, this tray of some sort. Uh, 2D adaptive to clear out this pocket here, I love it. Uh, 2D pocket to clean up, that's a little bit of a quirkier use there, but I'm not going to criticize, it's okay. Uh, Contour, I like that. Um, and actually, I did want to mention, if you're newer to the software, uh, a mistake that we see a lot of folks do, uh, probably more so over like here on the 3D adaptive, is they will assume or use the 3D adaptive as a finishing strategy. And I'm not going to lie and tell you I've never done that, but but don't. You, you, a few reasons. It's an adaptive strategy, so it is, um, as I understand it, subject to um, a few things like your tolerance right here. Uh, it's going to allow itself to violate the solid model. 
Um, and that's another good tip. If you have a really intensive uh, processor intensive part or complicated part, go ahead and increase that tolerance. It's going to make it compute the toolpath faster. Uh, on the flip side, a lot of times I set this to one thousandth of an inch uh, on our you know pretty basic type stuff. So 2D contour to do a cleanup there. Slot, um, I don't use slot a ton. That's not to say it's not a great thing. Um, but then his the reason he emailed us was this guy. Um, he wanted to machine these fingers here, and he was uh, he either gave up or he was trying to use an adaptive as a finishing strategy. So again, from a tooling perspective, I would definitely avoid using a ball end mill if there's much of this work to do. Um, I like to treat ball end mills as specialty tooling, where when I use them, I tend to want them to be good and sharp and in great condition. So I'm going to try to do as much roughing as I can with a square or bullnose end mill, which we keep more of in stock anyways. Uh, but the reason for his question was containment. Uh, and before we run out of time, I'll just show you on this part, um, I was practicing here. This is a little tricky. Um, there's some funky CAD geometry here with this uh, fillet. But if we let's see here, uh, if we go into machine boundary, don't just assume because I put my mouse, say, right here, that that is the only option for a machinery boundary selection. Take the time to kind of work your mouse cursor around to different areas, and you'll see it changes. That's a lot better. Um, I could not get it on my own, though, to uh, include the fillet. Um, so if I wanted to do that, what I would probably do is... Uh, so I think the reason, John, I'll just speak up because I think it's, it's good to understand. You selected that edge on the fillet and think of all your selections as waypoints on a map. Um, and you actually wanted to pull it off where you, where you initially made your selection. So you, your first selection shouldn't be one of the edges that you don't really want your selection on. Does that make sense? So no, it doesn't. So you want it to roll down far. You want it to catch just that one tray? Correct. So you need to, your first selection needs to be one of the edges you know is going to be part of the finished solution. So like this guy. Okay, so let's see if it, um, so the, okay, another great point though. I picked this and I've got this huge finger and in, in box. That's okay. Now, if I hover over, no. So you want to reselect um, that. Yeah, so pick that first one the way you had it. Yep. And yep. then the click the green one again. And now select that bottom edge of the fillet. And you, you might have to click twice. So click there and then move over to the left a little bit and, and click again. So reselect and route it through on those other edges. It's getting closer, so I want you to route. Oh, there it was. In that case, it doesn't like that one edge, does it? It doesn't. Um, well, let me show. Um, Al, I, I say Al may be right because he usually is right, but um, you don't always have Al on the phone with you. So let's go back to model. I will do a new sketch project. Um, and this isn't really a CAD webinar, so I don't want to get too far into it. But if you, uh, if you know what, I'm glad you're doing this too, though, because it's the other thing people often forget. You are in a powerful CAD system, so leverage it when necessary. Right, and again, my attitude is usually I need to make the part, not argue. Uh, I have no tolerance for people who tell me I'm doing it wrong because when I make the parts and they come out well uh, and I get it done, I get it done. So I've used uh, the CAD platform here, Inventor, SolidWorks, Fusion, whatever, to create a new sketch. So I've got that sketch. Go back into CAM, my adaptive geometry. Um, now, I'm a big fan of the light bulbs here that are going to let me toggle visibility. So I can turn that off and make sure uh, I'm picking exactly what I want it to pick. Uh, in this case, I want it to be just this sketch. And you know what? That's kind of funny. That's giving me a little bit of a, there we go. Boom. So now I should have the exact toolpath containment that I want. Um, like I said, I would switch this over to a, a bullnose end mill, uh, and I would do the roughing, 
for the adaptive strategy with that. And then on a, uh, you know, we did a we did a YouTube video that I would actually encourage everybody to watch recently on a DIY injection mold, and we went into some strategies on using both the scallop um, and actually the pencil. Um, there's a way to use the pencil to actually do some finished machining on these cavities, but I would switch this over to let's say a. Uh, there we go. Bulldoze end mill. That's perfect. I'll make it a little bit smaller here. I don't. I don't even know the size of that pocket to be honest with you. But you know, on a tool like this, you're not going to have the uh, center area with with zero surface feet per minute so much. Get your tool path and then go to 3D. We'll just say parallel. I'll do a ball end mill here. Let's see what we got already built up. One eighth inch. And just make sure you choose rest machining and from previous operations. I'll do a small step over five thou. And, and guys, this is amazing. Like this is what I love. I, I kind of remember back to 2012 and when I was using oops um, software that just didn't have the ability to create toolpaths that are this quick and this awesome. Um, pick my bounding box of this guy or selection. Oops. Well, that's, uh, I don't want to, uh, what I want to show you was we were getting the parallel was running sort of north-south here, which is not obviously the best way to do this because we've got a, a better machining strategy to go left to right or east-west. So I will change the pass direction by 90 degrees and I believe, I believe that will do it. Um, so yeah, there we go. So obviously your machine, uh, like it or not, when your machine moves, it, it induces, you know, Newton, Newton's law, like it or not, is going to stick around for a while. So by able to have reducing the number of times the machine has to change direction, you're ultimately going to get uh, a faster part with better finishes. Um, and if there's one takeaway I would leave, it's kind of what Al said, which is, um, which is take, you know, one step at a time. You know, I don't, uh, Usually your passes tab is going to have a lot of juicy information about the direction and style of toolpath, and the geometry tab is going to be where you get a lot of the meat uh, around uh, toolpath containment, avoiding touching surfaces, and so forth. So uh, if you guys want, I'll, I'll call it there, and we'll open it up to, to Q&A. Okay. Yes, so John, I'm seeing a couple of questions here, a bunch of people suggesting different ways they would have attacked the part. So it's it's definitely exciting to see how you've inspired a bunch of different thought. Um, we can all see the questions being typed. If you don't know, in that GoToWebinar section, there's a spot to type a question. Uh, so as John said, he's free for questions. Um, so but again, I want to emphasize, when you do get a, a workflow down that you really like, you know, for us, um, we're, we're pretty basic machine shop. You know, a lot of parts that are going to come in for me are going to get uh, faced. They're going to get roughed with a sh an aluminum shear hog. They're going to get a 2D contour. They're going to get a horizontal, and then they're going to get a spot drill tap. Create a template with, that has your settings with your tool library and your step overs, your feeds and speeds with all of those, be and create it with everything in it. Because guess what? When you don't have a part that has a spot drill, drill tap, it's a lot easier to right-click, create from template. Um, I don't even know what one of these is. You know, John Demo. It's a lot easier to click the ramp and scallop and delete them out than it is to go find the second template for spot drill tap or the second template for something else quirky. So there is a good question here, John. Uh, maybe I'll just answer it, but it's in regards to changing the speeds and feeds in the operation, the properties page of an, an operation. So maybe just pull that up so everybody's on the same page. Uh, so this page, so, so there's a hierarchy of speeds and feeds I think is important to understand. At the highest level, you have a tool that's in a, in a library, and that's something you've stored. When you go to use the tool in a document, it's going to move the, the copy of the tool into your local document. You can override it there, and then that change can live just within your document. So every time I use the half-inch end mill on this part, uh, it's now over in, 
And then at the operation level, well, when I'm roughing with this tool, I want specific for this contour or that contour. Now it's uh, you're adjusting the speed and feed just at that operation level. Can you see the questions in there, John? In the uh, I think I can. I think I just pulled them up. Uh, so is there a feature that shows the stock left on the part after simming gradient colors? Uh, my understanding is that that HSM does not yet have a topography map. Uh, so we post do have that. So incidentally, we do have that in our HSM Works product, and actually in okay. HSM also. Okay. Um, there's some technical stability reasons for why we haven't introduced it in Fusion yet. We want to get it there as soon as we feel that it's not going to cause instability issues. For you guys, if you're... Uh, if, if you, oh, sorry, if you're probably going to tell the trick I was going to do. Showing transparency is probably the best way to, to do it for now. Uh, so, yeah, real quick, if you don't even know what that means, what you can do is you can simulate a part and then basically have it show a, almost like a heat map or a signature map and have it show in certain colors where how where material is left and by based on what color how much material is left so it's kind of like proofing out your code um, the trick here you're saying is to change to uh, transparency uh, it should transparent it's not a perfect solution but it's it's a solution that starts to give you the answer and that's another thing I will say, the one time, I love simulation. I've only been bit by it once in my life, and that was when um, you got to remember that your CAD model can effectively backfill a simulation. So one of the things I always suggest before you f do that final post out your code to uh, you know, sneaker net or the machine is to do a simulation, go to the end of the tool path, and this isn't a finished part, uh, from a CAM perspective here, and then go up and turn off your visibility of your solid model. That way, you may not, you don't have the risk of a solid model hiding what would have been a, a collision or crash or linking move or something like that. Okay, how do I measure circles or distance between whole centers on the mobile app? I have no idea. Maybe pull up the mobile app for people that haven't seen it. This file, you could even do this file, mobile or or open in webs. So if you expand out your uh, uh, data panel there, open this file in web. Uh, I also have not tried measuring between circles, so John and I can flounder together. Um, but either way, we can show you the mobile app for those that haven't seen it. And Al, I just want to give everybody a heads up that we're rapidly approaching the end of the hour, so we are going to have to wrap this up pretty quickly. Um, however, super excited to see the mobile app, so let's see what you got. Uh, yeah, so click the click the image in the top left there, and that'll. Uh, this is opening a browser, but it's similar as what it what it would do if it's in a in a mobile. Wow. Who knew? There's there's a measure on the bar down there. Uh, six from the right. So try picking two holes and see what happens. Uh, do I need to switch measure object? Ooh, I'm not getting anything here. Design. We switch into design. Is that? Uh, yes, you you wouldn't. So right now you're in toolpath. Yeah, you'd have to switch over to design. Okay, so. Measure uh, I, I, I it looks like that's not supported now. I'll have to bring that back <laughs> to the EM team. So great great thing. I'm glad it came out. And yeah, so Jordan, I think maybe you probably should wrap things up because we are on the hour. Uh, great, great question. There's some more questions here that uh, maybe John and I can help answer afterwards. Absolutely. You've got your work cut out for you. We'll, we'll get these questions. So, guys, everybody on this webcast, you know, get your questions submitted. We'll go, we go back through those and do our best to answer every single one. So, great resource. And I'd just like to remind everybody that if you found this valuable, please invite a friend because we do this every Friday. And then for those that are brand new to CNC machining on Wednesdays, we have a free 
Start program. So for those of you that have no experience, that's where you want to be consistently every Wednesday with Wayne. It's a great program. We also have the Autodesk Education Program. So for those of you that have friends and family that are students or educators, please let them know. Autodesk will go into your school and outfit every student, every lab for free. So it's a phenomenal program. Please take advantage of that as well. In addition to that, there's the Autodesk Knowledge Network, which everybody should be bookmarked, should have bookmarked already. It's your go-to place for information, and it's one of the most active websites in the Autodesk ecosystem, so it's just absolutely phenomenal. John, you did an amazing job this week. I want everybody on this webcast right now to go out there and subscribe to John's YouTube channel. I personally subscribe to it, and I just want to thank you for providing so much value to the community and joining us today. I appreciate it. My pleasure. And if anybody wants, uh, you know, we love getting user input for our Fusion Friday uh, video using the HSM Cam. So uh, you can figure out how to contact me a variety of ways, including the website or YouTube channel. But we're always happy to get content that's real world examples of how to figure out how to make parts. Yeah. So you know, guys, get on there, interact with with uh, with John on YouTube. Send him a send him some information. Get in touch with us. Tag your parts that you're making on Instagram. We love seeing all the machinists out there tagging HSM, tagging Fusion, because the workflows are generally all the same. So it doesn't matter whether you're using Inventor. It doesn't matter whether you're using SolidWorks. It doesn't matter whether you want to access this technology through the cloud. It's truly an amazing time that we're living in. So thanks so much, everybody. We'll see everyone next week. Same place, same time. We're going to have new content. So excited. John, you're the man. Thank you. Al, Wayne, the extended HSM team. We couldn't do this without everybody's support. So thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, John. You rock. Take care. You too.